Welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today, our guest is Phil Rubin, president of Therabreath. And in this conversation, we talk about how they uh, compete with some of the largest consumer packaged goods companies in the world. Um, Therabreath is the, is the third largest oral healthcare company in the United States. And how do you compete? And how do you stay nimble when your competitors have uh, larger staffs and much more money in their coffers, how do you compete and stay nimble in that environment? We talk about that. We also talk about how they're able to become relevant on TikTok and formulate their product so that it's interesting, accessible, and part of the zeitgeist of social interaction on TikTok. And I really think this is a case study in how you know, brands can formulate their products and services to be relevant on social media. And then finally, we talk about Amazon and how uh, they sell on Amazon, how they integrate the learnings from Amazon into their larger e-commerce business, and really how do you handle uh, working with such an important uh, channel in Amazon. Let's jump into this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast. Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Today, our guest is Phil Rubin, president of Therabreath. And Therabreath is the third leading oral care provider in the world and recently announced a new product, the Immunity Support Oral Spray Supplement, which supports your immune system with a convenient spray. And Phil, you've been with the company for a long time. I want to talk about this new product. But before that, I want to talk about, tell us a little bit about the story and history around Therabreath. And full disclosure, I take my, my, my dental health super seriously. I don't mess around with it. I go to the dentist every six months. I do everything I have to do because I've got those Eastern European genes that, that make it absolutely necessary. So I've, I've actually used Therabreath. I was, I was really excited to interview you because I, I used the product prior to us even uh, connecting. So thanks for being with us today. Tell us about tel uh, TheraBreath. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you for being a user. We appreciate it. Um, we're starting to run into that more and more, uh, which is always exciting. Um, so TheraBreath is uh, an oral care uh, brand. We focus on mouthwash. Uh, we make toothpaste. Um, uh, now we're involved in immunity um, spray vitamins and, and things like that. We saw a pivot over the course of the last year, year and a half. Um, Therabreath was originally started by Dr. Harold Katz, who's a dentist here in Los Angeles. I don't know if you remember his um, office is on Pico. Uh, he and his brother Richard started an office on Pico where they had this really great sign uh, that looked like a toothpaste tube, squeezing out toothpaste. Um, okay. And so uh, Dr. Katz uh, started working on uh, breath odor research um, about 25 years ago um, and had a series of breath clinics that he operated. Um, all over uh, California. And uh, the first TheraBreath formula was kind of born out of those clinics, uh, was presented in those clinics to patients, uh, became very, very popular. There's actually a great story about uh, how one of the breath clinics patients at the time was a soap opera actress um, who required TheraBreath being used in all kissing scenes on her rider moving forward um, after trying the formula. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, and that's kind of how things started to uh, grow for Dr. Katz. And next thing you know, he had some limited distribution. Um, and he went online, uh, really making him an original digitally native brand, which is kind of cool considering the fact that he was starting out 25 years ago. Um, so he, he went national. He uh, made some uh, attempts to scale. And then um, I was brought in to kind of help with uh, brand building and, and some you know, product development and focus. Um, and so we started a, on this path together where we um, basically started a conversation with a, a modern consumer. You're a perfect example of somebody who we want to talk to. You are concerned about oral health. Uh, yet even as somebody who raises his hand and says, yes, this is something I'm interested in, um, this is a common conversation that we had when we started, which is, hey, do you look at what goes into your bread and your yogurt? Do you read the back of those packages? Do you look at the labels? 
It, it depends on if uh, if I'm on a food kick or not. If I'm not in a food kick, then I eat everything under the sun. If I am on a food kick, if I'm paying attention to my health the way I should be, I, I read the labels. Absolutely. So occasionally over the course of your life, you look at the labels. And at that point, you kind of became familiar with probably what was slightly better or slightly worse, depending on uh, you know what the package said and what the brand stood for. Our question was, have you ever looked at the ingredients in your toothpaste? Or in your mouthwash. Most people said, no, actually, you know, I stick to bread or whatever other label. Well, here's the point. If you're using toothpaste and mouthwash as recommended twice a day, every day, as long as you live, you will consume toothpaste and mouthwash more frequently over your lifetime than anything else other than water. No kidding. There's nothing else you're eating twice a day, every day. There's nothing else you're, you know, eating. so those ingredients were really important. That conversation was really important. And when we started that conversation, right, because this brand, again, was uh, digitally native, uh, basically made by a dentist who was very concerned about what went in it, um, and we carried that tradition forward. Um, once we started that conversation, all of a sudden, things kind of changed in oral care. It allowed us to disrupt that entire industry. And, you know, now, some years down the road, um, Right, we outsell these brands that I remember as a kid being mainstay brands like Stoves or you know Colgate, things like that. Uh, at least in the mouthwash space, that's that's where we find ourselves now. So, so Phil, what, to do that kind of, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. You know, we're really interested to understand how how companies grow and scale. So, you know, I'm looking at your LinkedIn. It looks like um, you started working with with uh, Thera Breath in uh, 2007. Um, you have a long history with the business. Tell us a little bit about, about the state of the business when you started working there in 2007. Um, so in 2007, it was a traditional kind of um, uh, entrepreneur, innovator-led business where he uh, was trying to touch a lot of different stuff. You know, he was trying to take some of the innovation and he was trying to apply it in a lot of different market segments because right, it was exciting. Um, so the business had lots of potential and lots of premise and a focus on excellence um, and also an internal culture of, you know, the people who worked there took a lot of pride in the business. Um, he's important. I've been there for 13 years, but there have been employees there that have been there far longer. The first hire is still there. Um, really? Yeah. So all of that stuff, when I showed up, like, so there were these great bones, but what they needed was the right they. Sure. A, a brand in a direction and, and, and somewhat of a focus in the story to tell. So, so, so basically you have kind of like an entrepreneur's dilemma, right? You have a great product, you know, you have a great product, you know, that there's need and you solve some really important problems for the marketplace. How do you focus mm -hmm. and where do you focus your time and energy? Of course, limited resources, every all, all the all the companies in the world have limited resources. Even if you have billions of dollars, you have limited resources. Where do you focus your time and energy to build your business? So when you came in, was your was your job originally to like, okay, we got to scale this thing, we got to grow it? Like, what were what were you what was your mandate? Um, my mandate was uh, marketing needed to be. There were multiple issues. Um, so what my mandate was and what I wound up tackling were kind of, you know, different scopes, but originally the premise was that, um, they needed to focus their marketing in a specific direction. Um, they felt that there were, you know, a lot of false starts, uh, the cost of the products were high because of what they were doing in terms of packaging. Um, but really at that point, what we, what, you know, what I saw was an opportunity to, improve cash flow by doing some more stuff in direct and focusing on strengths and, you know, kind of optimizing assortment and then um, radically restructuring the entire kind of brand and brand value proposition. So you had bones, right? But you needed, you needed a bunch of other uh, stuff that would complement those, those bones uh, to really make. So something. really you're, so, so really it was like, okay, how do we, how do we present ourselves to the marketplace? What do we say? How do we say it? What's the key message that we want to get out there, right? So, so you, I imagine you have a number of different use cases and and problems the product solves, and you're like, let's create a let's create a through line throughout each of those products, services, messages, etc., so that we have a unified brand in the marketplace. Is that kind of like what you were doing? 
but in a sense, that's what needed to happen. But it's not. What we, it's not really what I did. Or what okay. We did. What we did first and foremost is, and I think this is this is the truth for anybody who wants to be truly disruptive, especially in a place that's dominated by giants. Right. We're up against P and G, GSK, J and J. Those are the people we sit next. Lots to. of money. Lots of MBAs. And we read lots of resources, lots of legal resources, lots of all sorts of other stuff. And they market that, you know, that when you look at Hollywood productions, right, everyone thinks that's a big deal. Consumer goods, the, the value of that marketplace is, is enormous, right? What, sure. What do you spend more on the, in a year, you know, moving tickets or Kleenex? Um, but so what we decided we were going to do first and foremost was build an unassailable product in terms of quality and position. Right. Like we're going to build the best mousetrap. We're going to get all these other people to test our mousetrap and tell us what they thought. And if they thought it was also the best mousetrap, we're going to you know, go out there and trumpet that. And we're going to f- focus on just this mousetrap and not on a bunch of other stuff too. Yeah. Hate to explain right. that so far. So um, what we did was we we focused on developing developing a series of products that. Um, even to this day, there's there's no other kind of pedigree that looks like our formulations, right? We started with a formulation guideline and a series of principles in terms of how we make things, how we view it formulas, how we view basically our long-term commitment to our customers. Because in, in a sense, we're a subscription product and or right. you know, and we're really a partner in self-care, right? It's we're not a widget, nor are we, you know, a, a kind of a a, a fad driven thing like makeup or whatever else where something that you're going to kind of rely on. So how do we tell you, tell you a story from an upstart brand that is relevant to you beyond like, you know, cute claims or flowers on the package or whatever. Um, so to this day, we're the only uh, products that are certified by, you know, we're certified by the ADA, but we're certified vegan and vegetarian. We're super certified. Movie. We're certified halal. Um, everything's made in the U.S., right? We self-certify a bunch of other stuff where we run, you know, we run panels of tests on everything that we do that um, I think is substantially above and beyond what anybody else in the industry does. And when we do all of that and it comes back as good or better than we expect, we, you know, a greater confidence grows within our four walls about what we make, why we make it, and how good it is. And when you have that, then the rest of it isn't smoke and mirrors, right? You're out there selling something real. Um, you're selling something important, and we charge more for it. But you know, we speak to it to say the kind of the difference between Folgers and Starbucks when Starbucks showed up. Yes, Starbucks was more expensive, but you understood why you're paying more because they brought quality, right? Um, and in a sense, that's kind of what we did in order to start our through line in terms of who we are as a brand and what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. So, so the takeaway for business owners, entrepreneurs, senior marketing executives is throw money at something that you believe in and make sure that the product is excellent. Well, at that point, it's not throwing money, it's investing, right? If you really have- I get it, I get it. I'm saying chase. Like here's my, and here's my, and here's my, my experience here. Very, very first job, uh, second job out of call, first job out of college, second job in marketing and advertising. I was working on uh, the Sony pictures business at Universal McCann. This was in 2004 to 2007 ish. And I was in the room when the head of marketing, there's really talented executive named uh, Dwight Keynes. He comes in and we're having, and I'm just like, Lowest man on the totem pole, right? Like I shouldn't have even been in the meeting, but I was. They took care of us. And we, the the question was about: Do we spend money marketing? We, they, do they spend money on marketing Spider Man? Right? Biggest movie, a ton of buzz, four quadrant movie. Everyone's gonna love the movie, young or old, man or women. People are gonna love it. Do we spend money on on Spider Man? And the question, and the answer, the thinking was yes, because it's a it's a dope movie. It's getting great reviews. Even though I would say a lesser executive, a lesser intuitive, a, a less sort of smart executive would have been like, no, nah, it's good. We'll be good. They actually put a lot of marketing budget against Spider Man, even though they didn't need to. Well, I mean, the question is, you know, how incremental was that budget? It might have been, right? Like, the right. executive, like, we're going to take the tent pole, we're going to put it up over the top. 
rather than right. the risk coming back and saying that was the flop. Well, all of our riskier movies, we can get away with right. it necessarily, right? That's not going to come as well. I totally get it. Um, but I agree, investment. This is an investment, yeah. right? You're, so the, the, the underlying foundation is have a great product. Don't do anything if you don't have a great product. Well, then that's why I kind of jumped on that word investment too. It's that conviction. Conviction sells and conviction makes is the difference between good and great, right? Um, if internally you're waffling or you think you still could have made it better, now don't get me wrong, you can't sit in R and D for three years trying to tinker. But right, but if it, 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 you either have to succeed quickly or you have to fail fast and be convinced about the next thing, right? Um, that you're going to do, but there's a bunch of CPG companies out there that kind of sort of present 30 or 40 things every year that may be kind of, eh, right? right. It's, there's a lot of churn that's required on the shelves in order to keep the shelves. But that's created this sub-industry within this industry of just like coming out with like, you know, the latest flavor of mint just to cycle shelf space. And the consumer is not served by that. And as a matter of fact, it's an enormous amount of waste. It's not core business. It's what's kind of developed around it because of large conglomerates. Um, we don't have to work that way, right? We can focus on building one or two awesome products a year and, um, you know, let the consumer decide whether they're relevant. Case in point, the thing that you brought up at the beginning, which is the immunity spread, right? So we saw February of 2020 as, as COVID was coming up, uh, you know, up that we saw that mouthwash and oral health was going to be a piece of or potentially a prophylactic treatment, right? Colloquially, it was a lot of people were speaking towards mouthwash and you know uh, zinc closets and all sorts of other things, which made sense uh, to people because to them it's like it's an upper respiratory disease. You're gonna it's gonna come in through nose and mouth, pretty much. So if you've got something masks, you know mouthwashes, whatever, that might give you some incremental opportunity to benefit. But since nobody had done any kind of studies and we saw all this fishing and oral care from consumers in terms of how do I help myself, we thought that the, the right way to do it would be to try to bring immunity support ingredients, things like zinc and copper and vitamin E and vitamin D and vitamin C and a bunch of stuff that has you know, subsequently been flagged as important. We're like, we can develop a spray version of that, right? Like people, rather than taking pills, you can spray it into your mouth, you get the vitamins, but you also get the benefit of having it in your own cavity, et cetera. And again, this is happening February, March of 2020, where there's not a lot of research in the space, but we see a need. So at that point, we pivot internally and we focus all our R&D on this one particular product. Um, and it takes us about nine, 12 months to formulate a, a mouth spray that is designed to improve or, or support immune response. Um, but there's no way that a major could do that because they've got probably 30 products in the pipe and they've all been planned out about three years in advance, right? And so- when, It's a slow yeah. process for and them. I, yeah, I, I get it. There's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of boxes to check, but being nimble, at least, you know, when you're coming out and having that level of conviction, you say, you know what, we're gonna do this, just this, we're going to do it now. We're going to try it out, then we'll move on to the next thing. Um, but it allows you to focus to develop conviction. So, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm curious, how many uh, how many products do you come out with typically a year? If you're not talking about like size or flavor variants, we probably yeah. do one or two products a year. Got it. And then you'll do some variations here and there. Um, that's interesting. And so where like in terms of your marketing efforts, I mean, let's start with like the last year. I mean, the last year, year and a half with COVID has been a boon for any legitimate business that is helping people stay healthy. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you capitalize on that opportunity without being exploitative? Right, because you don't you don't want to be seen as taking advantage of a situation, but you definitely have a product that people should or could be using to keep themselves healthy. Well, I mean, a great question to answer in multiple parts. One is in terms of actually addressing people's concerns, you would have to work on like we did, work on a specific product that addresses those concerns, not say, oh yeah, you know, this thing, this stuff, absolutely, yeah. You know. But because the studies aren't there, the, the background isn't there, that's snake well, which we would never do. 
Um, in terms of pivoting into need, uh, yes, people really focused on, on, on their personal health over the course of last year and a half, which is great. Um, oral health has seen some benefit from that. The category, uh, mouthwash category is relatively flat. Um, however, our business close to double last year, right? We, we took a bunch of share and we also expanded the overall size of the marketplace by introducing new products targeting younger people, things like that. So we, we, did, we didn't take advantage and there was an opportunity to do that by saying, you know, this is somehow relevant to COVID or pandemic. Um, but what we did do was we kind of, we read the room, we kind of tried to understand the calendar of what things will look like from, you know, both in terms of our retail partners and um, consumers and, and everything else. Um, and so we pulled advertising that was necessary pushed a bunch out when things started to free up and, and come available. We tried to pivot into creating additional capacity because, again, we were up over 80% last year, and that was on a mature brand, um, you know, in a category that was up 81 How did you do that? What did, what, what's, what's a learning or a takeaway that, like, how, how, can a, like how can a business, a product-based business, what's the learning there that, that can be deployed for a, a service business or a product business? Is it... The culmination of many years of doing great work is it like we something just clicked the mindset of the consumer change is there anything that can be replicated what's the nugget out of that learning oh man I mean, what, what you got to do is you got to understand that it's never going to be 100 percent out of one thing it's going to be two percent out of 50 things right legit <laughs> um, so i mean for us it was a bunch of that so first and foremost you know it, back in february i remember sitting down for our team saying people are going to run into massive supply chain issues we need to prepare for that now, right? And so when we had competitors start to fall by the wayside because they couldn't get the logistics uh, in line, they couldn't get containers filled in, in time, they didn't have time booked on their lines, we had product on the shelf for the most part. That was important. Um, we pulled back all of our advertising you know, during stock up so that we had all of that those resources to play later on. Plus, again, it, it wasn't the right time to be messaging stuff like that. Um, and also, we were starting to approach critical mass from a growth standpoint. We had seen 20 to 30% growth per year for the last you know, decade or so. Um, and then also, there was that match. And part of that match was social media. Um, when TikTok became a thing, for some strange reason, we became a huge TikTok darling. Really? Very, very interesting thing, yeah. Um, we saw... Uh, posts by major makeup influencers, all of us. Now, again, this has something to do with just getting ready. Uh, two to three years ago, we went to our drug partners and said, we believe we can expand the size of this set, right, the mouthwash set, um, by bringing in younger consumers. Younger consumers are not that interested about uh, medical preventative. Um, they're primarily interested about more cosmetic need. So we made this healthy smile mouthwash that is designed to remineralize teeth, make them more pearlescent give you a prettier smile and keep your breath fresh. Put it in this beautiful hot pink bottle, uh, gave it to various influencers, you know, everyone from uh, Oprah Magazine on down recommended this thing uh, at the end of 2019. And then 2020, this hot pink bottle all of a sudden just started popping up on TikTok left and right. Um, in TikTok hauls, in, uh, uh, Target haul videos, and TikTok made me buy it, all these big, um, kind of mean kind of, of placements. Um, that may also have to do with the fact that we've gotten really solid BuzzFeed love for about three years where they've done multiple articles featuring us. Um, so a lot of that kind of came together. Um, and I think we got also more attention being paid to us right as COVID was hitting because we did, you know, we were using zinc and again, some of these other ingredients that would have these flashpoint moments of attention. Um, so, so what's interesting, interesting, Phil, is like the, the underlying product doesn't change. What changes is you now have a hot pink bottle that appears, I mean, that appears, that, uh, that appeals to influencers. You can do something fun with it. Yeah, well, true. And we moved away from there from the, a straight bad breath, fresh breath message. So we gave them a little bit more room to play with it. Right now it's about beautiful smiles. It's a different thing, right? On Insta. And, um, but the formula obviously changed. I mean, this is a, a new formulation, and a new, but yes, it's still Well, not. the formulation did change. So yeah. you change a formulation to focus on 
Well, I mean, it's a new formula, All right? So we, we were traditionally a fresh breath, uh, we were a fresh breath brand. Uh-huh. Then we also became a gum health brand, right? As, as we expanded. Then we became a dry mouth brand. So with the, always the intention having been to provide people opportunities to solve for their oral care needs as they, right, as they start to use their breath and grow older. So it's fresh breath and you'd move on to gum health and dry mouth uh, as you got older and you need more prescription medication. But we hadn't gone kind of down the line and gone for younger before that. And so this was our healthy smile formula that came out about two and a half years ago was that approach to getting a younger audience in the mouthwash set. And it was there and hot pink and cute and didn't talk about bad breath. And does that still exist? Awesome. It does. It, I'm on the site now. You have a hot pink, looks like yeah. a neon blue and neon yellow, kind of like the color of Gatorade. That's cool. Well, that, yeah, that brand presentation is very unique on the shelf. Um, I'll tell you what. I mean, when I, when I showed up, one of the first things I did was I rebranded using these particular uh, concepts. And, our distributors hated it, right? They just really hated this new look. Yeah, somebody said to, to us, "Like, man, this is going to make my eyes bleed." I was like, "You know, that's a little part of the point, man. I mean, you got to get people to pay attention." So, yeah, we have this rainbow look, and every time we add an item, that footprint grows. It becomes more colorful, more spectacular. People tend to love it. That's awesome. So, so you really, I mean, with the with the hot pink bottle, the focus on the healthy smile formula. Was was it prescriptive to focus in on on social media? I mean, w- w- were you like, okay, how do we, how how do we get attention in a way that's kind of like interesting and, and much and much more fun than like the competitors who are who seem to be kind of like boring? Yes, I mean, I think that part of it had to do with the fact that we wanted to have an honest, uncluttered, simple conversation with people about oral care, right? Like. You got to keep it kind of fun. And uh, Dr. Katz, who's our founder, who does a lot of our TV, is excellent at that. I mean, he is, if you had him as a dentist, you wouldn't worry about going to see a dentist, right? Like he's, he keeps it light. He doesn't make it seem kind of gross or, or, or like, you know, personal. Like everyone gets bad breath. Like that's, that's, that's a fact, right? Everyone needs to get over it. Um, one of the things we love to share is that there are more bacteria in your mouth right now than people on the planet. But oh, everyone, cool. That's good to know. Uh, everyone. Everyone. Ah. Yeah. Or inside the toilet, right? More, more, more bacteria in your mouth. They live there all the time. And so you just got to keep them in balance and it's easy enough to do. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. So, so I didn't realize Dr. Couch was, is, he's, is he a practicing de- dentist? Um, he no longer practices. He's now uh, basically he's the CEO of the company. CEO of this company, but he yeah. was at one point a dentist. Absolutely right. So really? Was, uh, well, yeah, he had an office on Pico with his brother. That's right, as you mentioned at the beginning. Okay, that's cool. And so, fascinating. So, so, so you you really took an opportunity to make this make your product, some of your products, formulate formulated differently, social media friendly. Um, tell us a little bit about some of your other marketing efforts. Um, I presume you work with a PR firm. Uh, we do. get press. We do. We work with PR. We work with. I mean, we work with a lot of media partners. We, um, I've seen your remarketing ads. After I went to the site, immediately get those remarketing ads. Yeah, I, I would say that some big pieces in terms of the business uh, part of it. I would say our Amazon relationship is incredibly important. Right, we usually represent between three and four of Amazon's top ten mouthwash SKUs and have for over a decade. So I was becoming basically the biggest mouthwash player online globally before we were even top five manufacturers um, in the US was was a key part of our uh, success. And I think that also that whole digitally native thing, huge volumes online thing probably uh, definitely helped support some of our TikTok and social popularity. Um, but if you also look at you know our online uh, listings, you'll see that we are the best reviewed items in the space. So again, ultimately why what's the secret to our success first and foremost people love this stuff and it is important to them um so so tell us a little bit about kind of like amazon as a channel versus like e-commerce from your site tell us a little bit about kind of like how it's different to to sell through amazon well amazon's uh right it's uh 
Yeah, that's definitely, it's a carrot and stick relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the friend one says, I mean, we built it uh, from the ground up a long time ago when we used to take, you know, trips to, to Seattle and meet with people in person, which um, hasn't happened in years. But there, there's a couple of important takeaways. One is uh, you've got to have both, you've got to have le levers to limit your price both up and down there. Um, and that has a lot to do with hybrid selling and how you manage your inventory and where it's capped and you know, how, how much inventory they can hold at any given time. Um, there's also real tricky stuff that happens on the Amazon in terms of sometimes if they're, if you're in a vendor situation there, they will um, offload product through auction that can then be um, onboarded back to Amazon through the 3P sellers, which will force pricing down. I mean, there's some crazy uh, mechanisms in there that are... How do you make sure that doesn't happen? <sighs> so I what's mean, a situation yeah. where that would happen? What, give us an example of like, so you're saying Amazon stores your product, Amazon then... Okay, so here's, a, here's an example of something that we saw. Um, we saw that there were, there were third-party sellers that were getting inventory they were bringing it back onto Amazon. And when they were listing the inventory because the UPCs were the same, Amazon was taking, and this was about a few years back, as far as we can tell, um, Amazon was taking some of that inventory and aggregating it. So the existing inventory and inventory that somehow cycled out and came back in was all being placed together on, on personal products. Um, and so we did some tracing there and it, it seems that the way that things were working is Occasionally, if somebody sent something back, they would put it into Amazon Warehouse and they would auction off lots of that stuff. And then those people were buying it, putting it back on. So then we had to build uh, an agreement there where we would take back returns rather than having we repatriate them. Wow. But I mean, so, that, that, just, that just took, I think, probably six to nine months to unwind to try to understand. So how that was. were these third party sellers selling, selling the product? Well, yeah, I guess it was basically buying it. I'm guessing it from Amazon bulk auction and putting it right back on Amazon with Amazon's regular product. And I don't know if it was because it was short dated or if they were consolidating warehouses. Wow. What the? So I guess I think like you know, Amazon does an enormous amount of business with us, absolutely enormous, um, and we value the partnership tremendously. Of course. But every once in a while, you'll see you know a pretty product you'll see price starting to wind down super fast. Um, and then you've got to get all hands on deck to scramble and protect that price um, because we've got to be able to afford to make it at the end of the day. Um, and when you do that and these weird little levers have been tri tripped in these businesses that are kind of, you know, arcane and hard to find, it can be a real scramble. So do you have, do you have different teams working on your Amazon business versus the teams who are handling your e-commerce or is it all like, is it, is it one practice or is it multiple practices inside your organization? It's one practice. So basically about three years ago, my whole thing was we're going to sell where they are, right? It's not, we have a relationship with the customer, not so much the retailer. We have a partnership with the retailer, right? But our going relationship is with our customers. They, they rely on us, they need access to the product. So we want to make sure that that access exists wherever the product the customer wants to shop. So if they want to shop at CVS or CVS.com or Amazon or Walmart or Target or wherever, we just have to have presence there and it's always got to be robust. And um, we don't really want to silo our teams in a way where somebody learns something on Amazon and then doesn't instantly apply it at Target or Walmart. Right. Or else. Um, and conversely, the other way as well. Um, so, yeah, it's we're platform agnostic on our e-com team and that works really well because everybody just focuses more on their lane, right? Whether it's content or, um, you know, media or whatever, inventory and stocks. So, so when you talk about, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the de demand generation part of, of a business, right? Like, um, if, if I, if I don't know about TheraBreath, how, I imagine certainly PR and press people are looking for a solution, but as a, as, as a, as a, as a human being who doesn't have my, my wife handles the household, right? Like whatever happens in the household stuff just appears, it disappears. I don't know what happens, but I know my wife has a handle on it. Right. And literally one day, uh, TheraBreath just appeared. I was like, all right, cool. I guess I'm using, I'm using this now. How do people discover TheraBreath? 
Great question. And by the way, a lot of our media uh, investment has always been on, um, I don't know how old your wife is, but typically it's, it's uh, female 35 plus shopping for household because they're the ones that decision makers, right? I mean, every brand tries to skew towards those, but it just makes a lot of sense. Um, this company works a variety of ways. We do in-store activation, right? But I think that a lot of our early discovery where um, before we had the funds necessary to, I mean, we, we run probably $10, $12 million worth of TV media a year now. But before we could afford to do that, that kind of heavy lifting, um, a lot of it had to do with online, right? And it was, it, our website still sees so um, much traffic where people are looking for solutions to specific oral health problems. Our direct website isn't really set up to be a competitor in our own products. That's not the point. We were there basically to educate people about our products. We know the transactions will not happen. You know, we had a multitude of other optimized sites like an Amazon. Is there a is there a push towards recurring revenue? Um, I, I mean, it, it hadn't occurred to me until you said it at the beginning of this of this of this interview that you you guys are effectively a recurring pro, your subscription service. With whether you want to be it or not, you are. Um, is that is that part of your business strategy moving forward? Trying to trying to enroll people in a subscription product, shall we say? Yeah, absolutely. Well, not a role, but right through quality. It's again, it's the Starbucks thing, right? I mean, Starbucks, uh, people who go to Starbucks are subscribers. Um, for us, we see that 25% of people, once they try Starbucks, will wind up repurchasing Starbucks over half of those within six weeks. It's the highest rate of repurchase in the category, as far as we know. And this comes from uh, major mass. Uh, retailers, market basket studies. Um, on Amazon, our rate of subscription is over 30%, which mm. is astronomical, um, especially considering how much business we do on Amazon. But it also speaks to exponential growth. It speaks to why we would, you know, we're going, say, 12%, then 18%, then 20%. Because uh, we're, we're picking up users quickly, and most of them tend to stay with us for a very long time, even if they don't necessarily buy us every month or every two months on a very tight cadence. Um, they still see the value of the product, they see the results. And uh, that definitely is the biggest driver of our growth. Awesome. Um, okay, uh, in the last few minutes, tell us a little bit about how people can find you. Oh, so yeah, Therabreath is available at over 100,000 doors just in North America. So um, basically any store you go to, if you go to, you know, Kroger or Ralph's or Bonds or Albertsons or uh, Walmart, Target, CVS, Walgreens, right? Uh, Amazon, uh, where, wherever you basically shop, we are available. Uh, we're available in about 35 countries, everywhere from South Korea to Turkey to Saudi Arabia to Kuwait. So, you know, um, we're actually uh, we're a huge phenomenon, in both in Japan and in South Korea right now. So if you happen to be there, please pick up some of our products. Also, uh, therabreath.com which I've had up this entire interview. And also there with com. Yes, please uh, come and check out. We have tons of information available should you be interested in more oral uh, health stuff. What is, uh, what is, you know, as we wrap up here, Phil, what is the next, what is the rest of 2021 going into 2022 look like for you guys? Any big key initiatives? Um, well, 2022, we've got a bunch of size brands, plus we've got a bunch of new launches. We're, we've got new retailers coming on board everywhere, everyone from Sam's Club to Urban Outfitters. So, I mean, we've got a, a really wide, interesting cross-section of retailers. Um, we are, you know, obviously, we've become a very big disruptor in uh, mouthwash. So as we've started to, you know, sell more mouthwash against the Colgate and Scope and, and Act, uh, there's enormous amounts of m a interest in us as as would be expected especially given the current environment so we're working through all of that kind of stuff as well um but we're expanding rapidly we're hiring on new people we just doubled our capacity with a major capital investment which was necessary since we doubled pretty much our volume from 18 months ago so things look great man you know and uh yeah, it, our, our people are happy. Everyone's working from home for now, but we've stayed productive. And um, you know, we're excited to see what happens when snapback occurs and people are out and about again. When people don't have to stop, people can stop smelling their own breath, <laughs> smelling the breath of others. Oh, exciting. Yeah. Phil Rubin, President, Therabreath. Thank you for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.